Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Andrea Bernstein. I'm the author of the book, American Oligarchs, The Kushners, The Trumps, and The Marriage of Money and Power, and co-host of the Trump Inc. podcast and your moderator for today. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series, and we'd like to thank members, donors, and supporters for making this and all Commonwealth programs possible. We're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. Today, I am truly delighted to be talking to Masha Gessen, staff writer at The New Yorker and author of the new book, Surviving Autocracy. Autocracy. Surviving Autocracy, yeah. if I get that right. <laughs> A longtime journalist, Masha's work covers Vladimir Putin, the resurgence of the totalitarianism in Russia, and the authoritarian tone of President Trump and his administration. Based on decades of reporting and experience from a childhood in the Soviet Union, surviving autocracy is Masha's, de Masha's devastating overview of the corrosion of the media, the judiciary, and the cultural norms that have occurred under Trump. It also traces how a few short years have changed us from a people who saw ourselves as a nation of immigrants to one where an ideology of America first can thrive. If you're watching along with us and have a question you'd like me to ask Masha, please put it in the text chat on YouTube and I will be asking them later in the program. Masha, welcome. So glad to be here with you. Thank you, Andrea. Sorry, Thank I just have to me. make a little adjustment on my Zoom computer. Uh, it's uh, great to be back with the Commonwealth Club virtually. I was there back in January in person and, and very much hope to do so again. So Masha, I wanted to talk a little bit just going back in time there were many people who became familiar with your work when the story you wrote right after the election, Autocracy Rules for Survival, went viral. So let's go back to that moment. What prompted you to write that article? And then how did you feel about the way people reacted to it? This was this bizarre moment when I was, I was riding my bike back from an election party in Queens. And, um, uh, you know, I think all of us have these memories of the disastrous election watching party on November 8th, 2016, when you tried to sort of slink away without saying goodbye to the hosts. So I did that, got on my bike. And as I was, as I was riding, it's a fairly long ride to Harlem. I started getting phone calls and messages from friends asking, well, what do we do now? Like, like I would know, like I, some, you know, somebody who has written, about Russia and the and Vladimir Putin's rise would know. And I thought, well, this is funny. You know, obviously I'm living in exile. You're I'm the last person you should be asking. But again, it's a long ride. So I kept I kept sort of thinking about it and wondering whether there are in fact things that I knew that Americans maybe didn't know. Not because you can directly transpose the experience of living in Russia under Vladimir Putin to the experience of living in the States. I mean, obviously there are vast differences, but because there are certain things that I had been thinking about for many, many years that most Americans had never really thought about. You know, what, uh, what happens to you as a journalist, a person, a citizen, when you live in, a, in mushy reality? What happens to institutions when they're confronted with bad faith actors? Those are things that uh, you know that I had to formulate for myself and consider over the years. And so I felt like, oh, actually I do have things to say. So when I got home, I was supposed to write a, um, a reaction to a, a short piece for the op-ed pages of the New York Times where I was a contributing writer at the time about the reaction to Hillary Clinton's election in Moscow. So I emailed the... <laughs> I emailed the person who was <laughs> I emailed the person who was minding the store and there weren't a lot of people minding the store that night because I think the New York Times stuff that they had put together their Hillary package and gone home. There was uh, there was a short performer piece on you know prepared in case Trump was elected, but there was no similar package as far as I know uh, for Trump's election. And so so I wrote the person who was minding the store that you know I think I should actually write a different piece. I'm thinking of calling it How to Survive an Autocracy. And he said, well, why don't we wait for the final results to come in? I said, you know, I can make it provisional, but it actually looks like the final results are in. And he said, eh, maybe not. 
so I got really mad and I wrote, um, I wrote the essay and I sent it to the New York Review of Books. Uh, and, and then we edited it over the next 24 hours with, and I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Hugh Eakin, who was, the, who was an editor there at the time, who really helped me hone it. And so it came out less than 48 hours after the election results were in, um, and yes, went mega viral. And a lot of the things that I wrote about, I think, continue to, to be true. Well, I mean, you know, I obviously everybody should read the book and buy the book, uh, but I think it's also really worth it to go back and read the essay, Autocracy Rules for Survival, because um, so much of it stands up. As a matter of fact, you spoke to some of my colleagues at the Trump Inc. podcast, and they said to you at in November 2016, Masha, you're a voice from the future, and now, now we're living in that future. And there were many, many things that I think at the time we... Uh, didn't really see coming, for example, the suspension of, of daily press briefings and, and the control of information uh, that were really clearly laid out. So talk a little bit about how you went from the essay to the book. What was that process? Uh, well, I've been actually working on a different book for the last few years. Uh, I've been working on a book mm -hmm. on imaginative political projects. And that's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a long-term project and it involves a lot of reporting, a lot of which I was going to finish this summer, uh, which <laughs> I'm not really going to have into that now. But um, at a certain point, I can't even remember why. Uh, suddenly I just felt like I really needed to write a book, uh, a short book that, um, that followed, on some, uh, followed up on some of the thoughts in the original essay, but also that just took stock of what has happened to us. Um, and it was, it was a difficult book to write because it was the first time that, what, uh, that I was writing for an American audience about something that we're actually mm -hmm. living through. A lot of, uh, most of my work has uh, both my political uh, nonfiction and, and my science nonfiction, you know, it has, it has done the work of making the strange comprehensible, right? Whether it's Russian history or medical genetics. And here there was something that was very familiar, something that we're living through um, on a daily basis that actually needed to be made a little bit more strange, right? That needed to be denormalized and um, and described in as, as a system, which is what, you know, I think your podcast does so well uh, on, on, uh, on a regular basis. So so it actually took a while to find the voice that I wanted for the for the book, and I ended up focusing, as you know, on on three things that I think really uh, where we really need to take stock, which is what has happened with institutions, what has happened to language and media, and how our self concept as a polity has changed. So let's talk a little bit about um, what is in that book. By the way. <laughs> I haven't thought about November 2016 very much, but uh, I was actually there underneath the glass ceiling that did not shatter that night at the Javits Center uh, in Hillary Clinton's campaign headquarters. And it was quite the moment because I think as the results came in and it sort of became clear what was going on, there were a lot of people saying, what now? What what do people do now? Uh, so it is. A, it was certainly a, a universal question that night. You write about Trump's autocratic attempt. Ex explain what that is. Um, wait, I actually want to to, to go back to November <laughs> 2016 as well because there's something that just reminded me. Uh, you know, because I think that the question that that Hillary herself and her campaign were asking themselves was you know, how do we react to this moment? And as you recall, she didn't make a concession speech right away. Um, everybody uh, kind of walked away from the Javits Center as well. And um, and she, uh, the consensus, certainly in the Democratic Party at the time, seemed to be that the tone of civility, some kind of constructive engagement was what was necessary. And that was part of what I was reacting against. You know, mm, uh, yes, it's very much place. so. Yeah, um, she but, and her husband uh, came out dressed in purple the next day. Exactly, exactly. 
Um, and um, yeah, and actually President Obama made a speech about Donald Trump's good faith, which I actually quote in the book uh, because it was, that hope was so misplaced and so clearly misplaced at the time. Um, so autocratic so I, I want to um, talk about autocratic attempt, but let me push you on that, because what okay. would what should President Obama have done not hand over the keys to the White House? No, I don't think that's possible. Uh, but I think that um, reflecting a sense that it was a national emergency would have been appropriate. And and certainly, you know, I mean, I think he was in a trickier position. I, I think Hillary was certainly in a position to to say that to say you know this is um a lot of what she did during the campaign you know she talked about trump as a, as a looming disaster as an impossibility right and what i think she should have done is come out and said the impossible has happened the unimaginable is upon us let's mobilize and react to it as the political emergency that it is so autocratic attempt <laughs> so autocratic attempt um, so let me explain where the language comes from. Uh, I, I'm a big fan and, and friend of a Hungarian political thinker named Valent Magyar, who is who's a former education minister in the, Democrat, uh, the briefly democratic government of, of Hungary in the 1990s, was a dissident in the 1980s, and now I think is in the absolute forefront of, of, of thinking about what has happened in Eastern Europe, what has happened, how, um, attempts at building democracy turn to autocracies. Um, one of his great insights is that in 1989, when the Eastern Bloc collapsed, we started using the language of liberal democracy to describe what was happening there. And part of the reason that we were doing that was because we just assumed it was going to be a liberal democracy, right? Because what else? It was the end of history. And part of the reason was that that's the language of political science. Those are the categories that we trade in. We talk about free and fair elections. We talk about the freedom of the media. We talk about other individual liberties. And when we're, uh, you know, we can talk, we can um, register their absence, but that doesn't go a very long way to describing a system to which these things are marginal. Um, the, the metaphor that he uses is you can say that the elephant doesn't fly, you can say that the elephant doesn't swim, but it doesn't tell you what the elephant is. So he has proposed a taxonomy of autocracy. Uh, and he, he has this wonderful thousand page book, book that's coming out this summer, but I had, I had an early, I had early access to it and, and to this thinking. Uh, and so he proposes that there are three stages, uh, an autocratic attempt, autocratic breakthrough, and autocratic consolidation. The difference between autocratic attempt and autocratic consolidation, sort of the thing that precedes the breakthrough is that you can still reverse the autocratic attempt by electoral means. So I'm assuming we're in that stage where I'm assuming that at least until November, at least in theory, we're in the stage of autocratic attempt. Now, obviously, uh, a little bit like what I said about sort of transposing my experience in Russia to the United States, you can't just take uh, a system of thinking that's developed for post-communist countries and uh, you know, transpose it to the United States. But there's, first of all, poetic justice in taking thinking that originated there and bringing it here. And second of all, it's very illuminating. I mean, that's how we work with models, right? You take a model that is that is highly developed and you sort of see which parts of this model fit here. And I found in trying to work with this model that actually quite a lot of it fits here, more than I would have expected. You, I mean, between the time that you must have finished writing this book, which, you know, seems from the vividness of it, like it was yesterday. Uh, and now... People have become, I, you know, it's used, I mean, I think that it's one of the interesting things is the idea of this could be an autocracy or Trump is behaving in an authoritarian manner. I'm hearing a lot more mainstream discussion 
of that. And I'm wondering how that feels for you, having written a book which was sort of, um, you know, contrarian to a lot of mainstream thinking, and now seems to have more and more adherence to a sort of what kind of government do we have? Is that surprising to you? Um, I think the process maybe has felt a little bit more gradual to me. Also, I should say, I finished the book, I mean, I, 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 fin I finished the book, <laughs> I guess, at the end of uh, last year, and then I reworked it uh, in April. Hmm. Wow. Because of the pandemic. So, um, yes, I had a very, at first, a very reluctant, but then an extremely generous editor and publisher who allowed me to do that. Um, so the book is brought up to date um, with the pandemic. And, um, you know, there was nothing about Trump's handling of the coronavirus that was, that revealed new traits but, uh, or, or new approaches. But it's just all the things that we had been observing and all the things that we had known about Trump and Trumpism became so much more clear, uh, you know, in, in such relief. And also, and also the consequences, the deadly consequences became so apparent. Um, so I kind of, you know, I'm lucky enough to feel like I'm, I'm just in the conversation. I want to make sure that we, I want to talk some more about sort of coronavirus in the current moment, but I want to make sure we um, get into the book a little, a little bit more. Uh, and I, and one of the things you talk about is the sort of expectation of the, of a Reichstag fire. Uh, I'm wondering if you can sort of unpack why you raised that and, and, and what that means. So the Reichstag fire is, I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredibly convenient historical trope. Uh, we, uh, so the Reichstag fire was an actual fire in the Reichstag that, uh, that occurred a few weeks after Hitler, uh, was appointed chancellor and he, um, in reaction to the Reichstag fire, Hitler introduced a number of severe restrictions on freedoms in Germany. And it, it is seen as the beginning of what Hitler's favorite legal theorist, Carl Schmitt, uh, called the state of exception. And there's an entire field of political theory that is, that is devoted to, to this idea of the state of exception. But I also think that, you know, in the vernacular, the Reichstag fire is the idea of, the, it's the one point of no return. It's the moment when the autocrat announces his intentions. And, and we all know that now we have entered an autocracy. And I think that that's not what the Reichstag fire was. It was certainly an important historical event and an important political event. But think about it. It was five years before the Anschluss. It was six years before the start of World War II. It was eight years before Ger uh, Hitler's Germany attacked the Soviet Union. Um, there's a lot of stuff that happened in between. Hmm. And this idea that we're going to have a moment of clarity when we know we're living in a state of emergency, when we're no, uh, in a state of exception, when we know that we're living in a autocracy, uh, that's too convenient a crutch for the imagination. In fact, uh, autocracy is established, I mean, in, in our case, I think the autocratic attempt is incredibly rapid. But it's still kind of gradual. Things happen, you know, little uh, step by step. Even the White House press briefing wasn't canceled overnight. First, it stopped being televised. Then it stopped being da daily. Then it went extinct. I mean, I think one of the sort of conundrums of this moment is things do happen sort of slowly, but also they happen so quickly that you've just gotten your mind around one thing and then the next awful thing happens and then the next awful thing happens. And, you know, one of the things that was interesting in going back and listening to some of the things and the discussions after the 2016 election was that there's so much that we've gotten used to now because it's sort of rushing out. And, you know, since your book is called Surviving Autocracy, it, you know, sort of suggests like it's, you know, kind of a self-help book or something. But a serious question, how is it possible for people to get their bearings when so much crumbles so quickly? Right, no, that's, that's the question. <clears throat> and, and in a way, I think this is a kind of self-help book. Like, um, 
Again, my aspiration is to do what Balint Manjir does for me. When I listen to him or when I read his books, things that I have been looking at come into focus. Uh, and, and all I kept thinking was, if I can just find a way to write this that, that performs that trick where, where you kind of listen to, uh, to, to it or you read it and you say, of course. Right. Um, it's, it's the thing that we, we have been lo looking at. It's the thing that we have been living through. But is there a way that we can think about it that feels solid enough that we can hold on to? Because if that's the case, then, then I think we can survive, right? We can, uh, we can hold on to enough clarity of thought to be able to engage in politics, to be able to engage in imagining a future. And that's the way out of this disaster. You spend a, you know, quite a <laughs> bit of time in the book uh, speaking about things that, you know, the sort of everyday awfulness of what's going on uh, in the Trump administration. And you introduce a, a word that I think is probably uh, new to a lot of people, kekistocracy. So can you explain what that is and, and how we've been witnessing it? I think you muted yourself accidentally. Masha, I think we've lost you. Somehow, I there you go. Right. Now you're back. Because I'm <laughs> so, using a phone and it's an incoming phone call. So, um, so I think it automatically muted me. So let me start again. Uh, I... Um, Kakistocracy. There are a lot of, <laughs> is the rule of the worst. And I think there are lots of words that we apply to Trumpism with good reason, right? Uh, autocratic attempt is actually one of them. Oh dear, I think we've muted again. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Right. Okay, I'm unmuted. It's like, okay. I feel like this is such a good metaphor for the current situation, which is like we're all <laughs> figuring out in the moment how to respond to these conditions of duress. So thank you for illustrating that for us. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's like um, uh, it, it, it's a question of whether are we inventing things or are we just really trying to to do without, you know, pants. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and most of the time I'm kind of. OK, I think that you. Yes, we lost you again. Stand by. We're having some technical difficulties. Sorry. Uh, I can hear you now. You sound good. Okay. I can't see you, but okay. I am back. <laughs> um, I seem to be horribly frozen, but um, so cacistocracy and uh, uh, is is the rule of the worst. I think we use the word corruption. We use the word, uh, you know, uh, uh, we use many many other words that describe parts of what Trump is trying to do uh, or what he has done. But I think cacistocracy is incredibly useful because there is an attack on government that is concerted and. Um, and clear and intentional and was declared ahead of time. And, um, and when he started appointing cabinet members, he was choosing people who were not only unqualified, but actually clearly opposed to the, uh, to the mission of the agency that they were chosen to lead. Um, yeah. Masha, I'm just trying to figure out if we can ask you to maybe call in because we're at a moment where I actually wanted to read from your book for a moment. Um, so maybe we could try to reconnect if that would work. Um, and while we're trying that, um, I'm going to read a few um, sentences about the book. 
Uh, so I hope that that is going to work for everyone involved. Um, this is from uh, a chapter about Trump's government. Uh, and it's interesting because it, um, it involves a, um, something that I spent a lot of time looking at, which is the intersection between the Trump family business and Trump, Trump's government. And I think that one of the things that's sort of inherently difficult for people to understand is that um, how abnormal it is that we have a president and his family, and in some cases, cabinet members and other administration officials who are profiting from private businesses while also ostensibly serving the people of the United States of America. Uh, so, I mean, I have used the word corruption to describe the situation, um, but that is something that you interestingly reject. So I wanna read this paragraph and then sort of talk about it. You write, and this is on page 44, Corruption would not be the right word to apply to the Trump administration. The term implies deception. It assumes that the public official understands that they should not benefit from the public trust, but duplicitously, they do it anyway. The opposite of corruption in political discourse is transparency. Indeed, the global anti-corruption organization calls itself Transparency International. Trump, his family, and his officials are not duplicitous. They appear to act in accordance with the belief that political power should produce personal wealth. And in this, if not in the specifics of their business arrangements, they are transparent. So I thought about that. And I, what is the word if it is not corruption of to describe what we are seeing in the Trump administration and how, you know, the president, his first outing uh, after the coronavirus started was to go to his own golf club in Washington, D.C. Well, it's called Washington, D.C., but it's actually in Virginia uh, to go there and golf on Memorial Day weekend, as uh, many people were uh, having memorial tributes to the 100,000 who had died. So what is that? What would you call that? Well, that's an excellent question. I don't know, you know, I don't know that we have a word for it. Um, I think autocracy is uh, is probably the closest it encompasses that because um, because it includes this idea that that it is the government or the rule of one man who amasses money and power, and one leads to the other, and and he clearly feels entitled to both and to the adulation that comes with that. I think that's also a very important component of it. Um, because as long as we use the word corruption, we're sort of taking it, uh, we're, we're, we're still functioning on the assumption that the government as we used to know it exists, but in some ways that we can't quite see and we have to investigate, uh, uh, or reveal as secrets, you know, in, in some ways it is being misused, right? It's that idea of duplicitousness. And, you know, we tend to look for secrets and I think secrets should be absolutely uncovered. And I have, I have great respect for um, my colleagues who are investigative journalists like you. And, um, but at the same time, I think that there is a lot to be said and, uh, and I am of this school of, of, of journalism for naming what is right in front of you or describing what is right in front of your eyes, right? And there's so much that's out in the open that we need to pause and take stock of in order to understand what is happening to us. I mean, a lot of what we do is also just bringing forward. I mean, you know, we have a podcast about somebody President Trump, who doesn't really ever want to speak to us, which is a very unusual thing in podcasts. Most podcasts are character centered. So uh, the character will be somebody who speaks to you a lot and you'll, you know, get many dozens of hours of tape and then you'll cut it down. Uh, but what Trump does is he does do things openly. He says them so quickly. A lot of what our job is just sort of to freeze the frame. Uh, and sort of point out the things that are going so by by so quickly that people don't notice and, and to encourage people to to pause on that. Uh, but I, I wonder if there isn't a new word needed to describe this, because you're right, it's not duplicitous. It's it's the president is openly profiting from his business. He's openly plugging his business. His family members uh, do the same. It's very confusing. Uh, but it doesn't just seem... Um, I mean, it, it isn't, they are profiting from their work privately. 
which is not necessarily the same thing is just a sort of a way of rule, which is what I think of when I think of autocracy. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, but, uh, and, and you know, I think we, we there's so much to talk about here. There's so much to talk about uh, sort of in the way that Americans have come to accept the marriage of money and power, right? Uh, have come have come to accept sort of a, a kind of nice, polite, politically and socially acceptable corruption, uh, and then Trump's obscene, in your face, politically and socially unacceptable corruption. Right? Um, so it's 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 slippery, and you know, and I'm not saying that the word corruption is useless. I'm saying that it it makes sense to evaluate our use of it and to evaluate what the meaning that we imbued with. I mean, that's, you know, that's true of all sorts of political words. Uh, I would say it's true of the word democracy. You know, when we, when we mm. say democracy, what do we actually mean? And how does it relate to the institutions of our government that we seem to always mean uh, when we say democracy? when maybe they're not the most democratic institutions that we can possibly imagine, or they haven't functioned in a, in a democratic way, or perhaps they're imperfect tools of democracy and we should see them in that way. So I know a lot of people that watching this are probably um, familiar with uh, some of the things that you've said about Russian interference in the US election or things that they think you've said. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, just take a moment to dwell on that because you do talk in the book in the section about how Mueller will not save us. And uh, you've been particularly emphatic in asking Americans to embrace our own role in producing Trump and Trumpism. Uh, and also making the point that Russia did not cause Trump, that Trump was a, a native phenomenon rooted in American history. Has there anything that's come about in either the Mueller investigation or the Ukraine investigation that has sort of changed your thinking about sort of Russia and Trump? Um, no, <laughs> you are not <laughs> going to be surprised uh, to find out that, uh, that no, there hasn't been. I mean, uh, I'm not, as some people might think, a Russia inter a Russian interference denialist. <laughs> uh, nor am I, as some people might think, an expert in Russian interference. I get emails all the time. Uh, thanking me for exposing Russian interference, right? And and I wonder, you know, what people have been reading, or who they think I am. Um, we will never know whether Russian interference actually played a role in swaying the, the election results. Considering the margin by which Trump won, anything could have played a role. Right? But if we were to discover that Russian interference added a million, two million, 10 million votes. We would still be left with at least 50 million Americans who voted for Donald Trump and who continue without any help from the Russians or with minimal help from the Russians, who continue to think that his reality, uh, his version of government, his version of who we are as Americans is the place we want, that they want to dwell. And that is, 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 is what we need to be facing, um, which is not to say that, you know, uh, that concerns about election security are misplaced. Of course, they're not misplaced, right? They should not be focused entirely on Russians, um, but they're not misplaced. But politically, we have a different problem. It's not the Russians. You uh, have a chapter headed, Mueller will not save us. And you, you write about the sort of false hopes that somehow the Mueller report was going to produce a, a criminal outcome that would solve everything, uh, which obviously did not happen. But then you also talk about how the report produced or provided the most comprehensive portrait of Trumpism to date. Can, can you expand on that? So um, it's now hard to remember, right? But just... Uh, just about a year ago, a lot of people thought that um, 
or just a little over a year ago, a lot of people thought that once the, the Mueller report dropped, everything would become clear and Trump would, uh, would be over. I mean, it's not the only time that, that people proclaimed uh, the end of Trump's presidency uh, or anticipated the end of Trump's presidency. But as you, uh, as you might recall, it was the most sustained sort of expect uh, campaign of expectation. It also had some very real results, and, and this is why uh, one of my big objections to the obsession with Mueller was that a lot of media resources, in particular at the New York Times, which we know because Tim Beckett told us so, um, were devoted to the Mueller investigation and to the story of Russian interference, possibly to the detriment of other stories about Trumpism and certainly to the detriment of creating, I think, a fuller um, picture of what Trumpism is in the present. Um, at the same time, I think that the second part of the Mueller report the part that was devoted to the obstruction of justice rather than to the actual Russian efforts was absolutely the most comprehensive portrait of Trumpism to today. It gave us the details of communications within the White House. It gave us the, um, the pervasive attitude toward um, government as it was constituted or at least as it was conceived before Trump assumed the presidency. Uh, it gave us the clear disdain for rule of law uh, and um, and for the system of checks and balances, especially uh, that uh, that pervaded the Trump uh, the Trump White House. And you know, then we saw it play out in the fall during the impeachment hearings yeah. when Trump White House basically just said, "Worth, okay, worth we remembering." Not- it's worth remembering That's that true. the day after Mueller testified. Uh, in which you told people hundreds of times to read the report and otherwise did not answer questions. The day after that was when Trump called Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine and said, will you please interfere in the next election? Uh, so there was a sort of seamless travel from that. Sorry to exactly. interrupt you. No, no, thank you for pointing that <laughs> out. And yes, I, uh, I mean, some of the uh, some of the research, the basic research for the book where I just went back and looked at the dates and that jumped out at me. I, I, um, I had not recalled just you know, weeks later that it was the day after, of course, because you know because the the, the phone call came to light a little bit late, later. But yeah, it was an incredible sort of rhyme and rhythm um, uh, that 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 illustrates so, so much of the of the of this presidency. But um, yeah, so in the fall, the White House says, you know, we're not going to allow White House staff to testify which is not only an act of uh, a contemptuous act, but actually an act of contempt uh, in the legal sense. Mm-hmm. And Congress has the legal power to compel or jail these witnesses and it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. One, of right. those, one of the many giant triumphs of this presidency over the system of checks and balances and one of the many illustrations of my thesis that institutions will not save us. Partly because they're dependent on norms and, 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 and culture, but partly because when somebody openly acts in bad faith and flaunts law, institutions are actually not able to stand up. And of course, I mean, the question of whether this, uh, the president is allowed to stop witnesses from testifying as well as blocking congressional investigations outright is, uh, currently going to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think that, uh, I mean, I think the courts have been, uh, there have been many judges and judicial decisions that have been real checks on Trump uh, or have tried to be and have certainly given a lot of information. But I think we're about to find out what happens when they get to the court with, of course, you know, two out of nine justices that Trump has appointed. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the present, and then I also would uh, want to make some time for people to have questions. So if you have a question, don't forget to send it in to us. Uh, I want to talk about this sort of current moment that we're in, because you spend a lot of time thinking and talking and writing, something I've also thought about a lot, which sort of the way Trump manipulates reality, the way he 
uh, blocks information, the way he controls the flow of information, the way he controls the media, the way he uh, sort of sends people scurrying with his tweets, uh, the way in which he has really managed to build a very different world from the one that even uh, sort of as tattered as it was, we remember from, from 2016. And I'm wondering if you feel like um, we're seeing any limits to Trump's control of reality, either in the in recent past or over his presidency, or do you just see it as growing and growing and growing? Um. That's a great question. And that's not the question I expected you to, to ask about the president. But, um, uh, you know, there are so many things that Trump does. Uh, there are, I'd say there are two ways in which he's actually politically talented. He is a talented performer. Um, and he is talented in the many ways that he intuitively knows to attack reality, right? Or our sense of shared reality because he employs so many tools at the same time and sort of uh, in seamlessly passing from one to another. One of his tools is the power of lie, where um, he, when he lies about the weather, when he lies about things that are empirically knowable in the present, and um, and yet he lies about them. And that's, that's the power lie, it's the bully lie. It's the, I can say whatever I want to when I want to, and there's nothing you can do about it because I have a bigger microphone kind of lie. And to an extent, he is right. Mm -hmm. He is right in the sense that we, we have to engage with whatever he says, even when we know that it's an, it's an utter lie, um, because it has consequences, because he is the president. Uh, then he also just uses words to mean nothing, whether it's when he just rambles on and, and leaves it up to journalists and um, and enablers to try to make sense of what he said, or when he says things and then walks them back, like for example, when he suggested that, uh, that uh, people should inject themselves or ingest disinfectant and then said he was kidding, right? What do you do with that? This thing that is on the face of it absurd and has been uh, marked by Trump himself as meaningless, and yet has real life consequences because he is the president, and also because people went and started drinking disinfectant. Mm -hmm. um, and um, because he has the, 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 the bigger microphone. And so um, all of that creates the sense of information anxiety, this, uh, this extreme state of duress in which we're all functioning. I think some people try to tune him out. It's become more difficult as our, uh, you know, with the pandemic and now with with the protests, it is virtually impossible to sort of say, I'm going to try to sit out this presidency and watch maybe the late night comedians and nothing else. Um, but there's also, I think, a temptation to accept at least a little bit of his reality or maybe move in fully. Just inhabit it, because then you don't have to be in this cognitively strenuous state of trying to balance fact-based reality and the Trumpian attacks on it at all times. It's an interesting yeah. phenomenon, though, because one of the things that I've noticed is that in the reaction to his coronavirus briefings, which you know they canceled because they saw they were getting him into trouble, it did seem like people were focusing more day to day on his words in a way that um, maybe wasn't good for him. On the other hand, one of the things that, you know, is complicated about this current moment is you never know, like, am I uh, thinking that because it feels good to think that? Or am I thinking that because it's really happening, which is a place where I find myself a lot. But I'm wondering what you think. Like, is there any, um, you know, the question that I said, is there any sign that, he, that this is slipping? Or is this just a sort of, um, you know, another one of those moments where it seems like maybe things are turning, but they're not? That's an impossible question to answer in the moment. Uh, I think, I mean, with the coronavirus, I don't think that that could have been a, uh, 
a point of, of, of turnaround for a few reasons. One is that, you know, his numbers were better during, uh, I mean, the pandemic continues. And this is actually, this is a really interesting point. The pandemic continues, the pandemic has not gone anywhere. But we have now marked a period as the pandemic, hmm. as the coronavirus crisis, because that's how the White House framed our time. Hmm. Um, there's, there's nothing in our actual lived reality that would delimit the pandemic in that way. That is, that is the power of framing that, uh, uh, that this president exercises. But in general, what we know about autocrats is that they are not actually, um, you know, they do not suffer from bad economies. In fact, uh, times of scarcity and um, and shortages tend to create anxiety that benefits autocrats. And the general state of terror in which we all find ourselves living uh, with the coronavirus also has a way of benefiting the autocrat. So I had very little hope for being saved from Trump by Trump's evident incompetence and uh, Callous disregard for human life, but the the current revolutionary moment, the protests all over the country, uh, that is, I think, a whole other story. Not because it detracts from Trump, but because that is actually um, a politics, you know, and and you know, imaginative politics. The, and and a, a negotiation in real time about ways in which we could live together in this country, in our cities, in our neighborhoods, differently than we do now. That is a surge in in politics that we have, the likes of which we haven't seen in many many years, and that I think is ultimately our only hope. Is not that Trump will somehow become less. That his base will become less, that he will um, that he will fail so clearly, that they will uh, that suddenly the laws of physics will will uh, obtain to him. But that the other part of this country uh, will find its feet and 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 will be able to to call into existence a glorious future that can be, can be placed in opposition to Trump's appeal to the imaginary past. So uh, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to um, bring in some uh, questions from viewers and listeners. I mean, you do speak in the book, and you actually speak at the beginning of the book, but I don't think at the end about how there will be a post-Trump world. And I'm wondering, you you mentioned some things, but I'm wondering sort of how do you see it happening and what happens in a post-Trump world? Um, well, you know, our people in our profession, people in general probably, but definitely people in our field, are well advised to stay away from making predictions. So I don't know how it's going to happen, uh, and I don't know when it's going to happen. I do know for a fact that everything ends and Trumpism will end. I hope sooner rather than later. And I know that we're going to have to, uh, to give up the idea that there was some imaginary pre-Trump normalcy that we just have to reestablish. That 2016 was great and 2017 was when our troubles began. Uh, I hope I tell a convincing enough story in the book of how much of the foundations for Trumpism, uh, how much of the foundation of Trump for Trumpism was laid um, in the years leading up to the election, certainly in the 15 years leading up to the election after 9-11, and how we will have to address much bigger issues than just Trump in order to be able to move into the future. Right? We have to address the marriage of money and power in this, in this country. We have to address the, 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 the failure of imagination. Right? We, um, we have to address the damage that also Trump has done, but uh, has done by using really fertile soil to our concept of ourselves. You know, we have been a country under siege since 9-11. Now we're a country under siege on steroids. 
um, that's a terrible way to be us. Right? There are definitely better ways um, to be us and the more visionary ways. And I think that's the only way that we can ultimately move past Trump is to, to create the, the hope that you can wake up in this country in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, and not be worse off, not be poor, not be more financially insecure, not be less equal, not live in a climate disaster, uh, you know, not worry about whether you have access to health insurance or whether your children will ever be able to leave home. Excuse me, let's take some uh, questions from some of the participants. Uh, one participant asks, are there any countries that have institutions that are able to stand up to powerful people? <coughs> Excuse me, powerful people acting in bad faith. And if so, how do they do that? Um, I don't think there's any perfect design. Uh, and we have certainly seen that in Europe uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the last uh, 20 years, but especially in the last decade. Um, and, you know, I mentioned Europe because the European Union is a set of institutions designed and thought about as, uh, you know, designed and conceived as representative democratic institutions that uh, are much more re re of much more recent vintage than our institutions here. And yet we see that they are helpless in standing up uh, to somebody like Viktor Orban, who actually has been a master of using European institutions to enrich himself and to solidify power. So I think that the very idea that institutions can be designed so well that they will forever secure a kind of democracy is misguided. That doesn't mean that uh, that American institutions were the best they could be by the time Trump ended power. Um, I think that our actually almost religious faith in institutions and in the foresight of the founding fathers has played an important role in uh, in sort of in in our failure to tend to the institutions we have. But also. Um, the thing about institutions, and this is probably more important, is that they don't exist uh, separately from the public. Uh, I talk about this in the book a bit, where, uh, you know, look at the travel bans. Look at the way that protest against the first travel ban fueled and enabled the courts to respond rapidly and, and, and strongly, and that the the diminishment of that response probably had something to do with the diminishment of the legal uh, of the judicial response. The public public politics enables institutions. It is where they're located, and and the only way that they can function. And if we just give them a job and hope that they will perform it perfectly, that's never going to work. So we have to revitalize politics. We have to. Uh, to be in an active conversation about how we live in the city, this country, this planet, in order to be able to both change our institutions in necessary ways, but also to make them function. And I think one of the things that's extraordinary to me about the last you know, period of recent weeks is that you know, I covered politics, American politics for a long time and uh, institutions always moved very slowly, particularly when it came to issue of policing, racism, police brutality. And there were things that were fringe ideas two weeks ago that are now not only being discussed in the mainstream, they've been enacted into law. And uh, to me, that is a, it's a stunning historical moment, uh, uh, almost as extreme as sort of everything else we're experiencing now, is that sort of there's been this kind of you know, tumble into a bottomless pit, but also this sort of rapid, rapid change in things happening. Now, of course, uh, you know, the history of American history is that none of these things are ever final and they have to be constantly fought for. But it is stunning to me how sort of, you know, quickly we can tumble down the hole, but then also how quickly things can 
can change. Absolutely. And that's, um, I mean, that's, that's the part of the story that is actually hopeful. A crisis is always also a moment of opportunity. And, and we have, you know, we are witnessing that in the, in the last couple of weeks. We're, we should be taking away from this lessons about how institutions function and lessons about how politics function. I, I mean, these last couple of weeks have given me an incredible amount of hope. I try to temper it a little bit because I have <laughs> covered both successful and unsuccessful revolutions. And, I, and the one lesson that I learned is that they feel exactly the same when you're in them. They <laughs> feel incredible. They feel awesome. Uh, and you can see what appears to be really rapid change of public opinion and, and the political situation. And then you can see retrenchment that happens just as rapidly. Um, which just goes to say that politics has to be sustained. No institution is going to be political in the place of politics. So one of the things that you spoke about was how um, sort of the autocratic attempt phase is bounded by elections. And we have a question about elections and there's been a lot of discussion about this recently. We just saw the kind of electoral disaster in Georgia and there have been many pandemic primaries that have been troublesome, Wisconsin and others. And so the question becomes, what does that mean? What does that mean for November? And is there an election? And uh, the question specifically that we have is, will the result of, what happens if the result of that election is not observed? I think that's, uh, that's a question that we have to be thinking about. And um, Donald Trump has very clearly laid the groundwork for not recognizing the results of the election. Right? Uh, he has laid that groundwork methodically and very much as uh, with a lot of things he does, very much out in the open. Starting with in 2016 when he perseverated on this idea that millions of immigrants voted illegally, even though he won the vote. And now with his uh, obsession with imaginary voter fraud, uh, the thing that we may have forgotten by now, but Twitter actually uh, finally confronted him over that those false state, uh, claims, right? Um, and um, knowing that, uh, I mean, let's try to game this out as though this were some other country where that sort of thing happens where autocrats or aspiring autocrats refuse to leave office and recognize the will of the people. The question is, uh, who is the military with? And that question goes to the, uh, to the issue of who has legitimacy. Legitimacy is a very slippery concept, but it has, uh, around election time, it has quantitative dimensions. Um, the more people vote for Trump's opponent, the less likely it is that he will be able to not recognize the results of this election. That's le uh, legitimacy in a country that has elections in the starkest terms. If he loses the election by uh, you know, 77,000 votes, like he won the election last time, we're in deep, deep trouble. If he loses the election by a measure of millions of votes, it's probably not as scary. You mentioned that you're working on another book project. And in, in the few minutes that we have left, I'd love to hear a little bit about sort of what you're looking and thinking about, because I think that goes into the very question, what happens after all the devastation? How does one rebuild? So, uh, this book is unimaginative political projects. And it, it took me a long time to try to figure out what it's, um, what it's conceptually about, right? What kinds of projects I, I, I look at. And I'm using once again, a concept that, um, that comes from Eastern Europe that I think is just incredibly useful for thinking. It's the, the concept is the parallel polis. Uh, and the parallel polis was uh, an idea that was proposed by a Czech mathematician, philosopher, and dissident in 1977, um, a, a, a man named Václav Benda. 
who suggested that in a totalitarian society, when an individual or even a group of individuals cannot have any impact on the regime because no, no politics exists in the public sphere, right? There's no, uh, the, the, uh, there's no interaction between the people and the regime. What you can do is you can create uh, a small polis. It has to be a polis, right? So it has to involve some kind of work across difference. It can't just be your group of best friends or, um, or your family. It has to bring different people together and it has to uh, function in accordance with a different set of rules in at least one area. So the economy, uh, society, uh, religion, or um, I can't remember what the fourth thing is now, I'm blanking. But, um, and then when the edifice collapses under its own weight, you're going to have a working model of the future. So that's the idea of the parallel polis. And the book looks at a number of very, very different projects, starting with an organic farm in Palestine and ending with the public transportation system in Medellin, Colombia. Um, and that's an important point because that to me is an example of a parallel polis type project, a project that is willed into being, but that also uh, is, is created by the government, right? because this is not a libertarian anti-government screed. This is not a, we do it on our own because we've given up on government. This is an exploration of ways that people are finding now of thinking and acting politically and creating perhaps time limited, um, but incredibly important functioning utopias. So when you talk about the future and you talk about sort of, I mean, the, uh, what was the stage uh, after autocratic attempt, if it works? Autocratic Is that victory. just autocracy? Uh, so, but but if things don't go to that, and you and there is some other uh, future after an autocratic attempt, what is the what are the steps between that between you know an electoral outcome that rebukes the autocratic attempt and building these futures that are reimaginative? Re okay. uh, well, it's hard to be prescriptive like that, but one thing that I think I know for sure is that we're not going to get there without some kind of vision. It's not like we're going to find ourselves on November 4th uh, of this year thinking, oh, well, he lost, what do we do now? Right? He is not going to lose unless there are very, very strong ideas that have been articulated that actually you know, create a blueprint for walking into the future. Masha, it is just always great to talk to you. And I want to thank Masha Gessen, staff writer at The New Yorker and author of the new book, Surviving Autocracy. Here it is with my post-it of things I wanted to ask her about. Uh, and uh, you should read that and everything Masha has written uh, you'll never be disappointed. Uh, so please order Marsha's book through your local independent bookstore. I also want to thank the audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Andrea Bernstein. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you.